to the virtual Bourbon Through Bluegrass with uh, Bourbon and Beyond. This year, because of COVID, we are in a little bit different situation. Uh, Hickory bought myself. Uh, it's Hickory, everybody. Say hello to Hickory. Everybody say, hey, Hickory. Hey, We've got Steve Cooley over here on banjo. Hey, everybody Steve. say, hey, Cooley, Steve. Um, and we got Jeffrey Faith on the bass over here. Yeah. And uh, Hickory and I were lucky enough to be able to uh, do the first Bourbon and Beyond. Uh, right there on the river, and it was great. We did this uh, tasting with the uh, Heaven Hill Distillery, which I am the brand ambassador for whiskeys for, and we were just proud to, to be a part of this this year. So we're going to taste six great whiskeys from Heaven Hill Distillery, a family-owned and family-operated distillery right here in Louisville, Kentucky, in Bartstown. And if you might want to taste along with us, you know, you, you, you could. Just, it doesn't have to be the whiskeys we're tasting through. You can just grab whatever whiskey you got, especially if it's a Heaven Hill whiskey you can but we're going to go through a little evolution of bourbon. And the whiskeys we're going to be tasting brings the story of how bourbon became bourbon from unaged corn whiskey. You see, you, know, you can see this is clear. This doesn't have the deep amber color that bourbon's known for. Because this is what Evan Williams would have been making on Main Street, Louisville, Kentucky in 1783. It's the exact type of whiskey he would have been making. And then we're going to see the evolution of this same corn whiskey that's going to be put into barrels as they went down the Ohio River and down the Mississippi River to, to, to New Orleans. And they would age a little bit, get a little color. We're going to go through that evolution. Then we're going to see how wheat came into the equation and how that, that, uh, that grain came into being in, in, in bourbons. And then we're going to see the watershed moment for bourbon, which would be the Bottle and Bond Act of 1897. And then, of course, we had Prohibition shut everything down and after prohibition uh, bourbon had a little little rough start back up it took about 40 50 60 years for it to start back up uh, really get going but it was a small batch of single barrel bourbons that brought it back so we're going to taste that evolution so i'm going to sip with poison us we're going to sip on this unaged corn whiskey called georgia moon and this is not just uh this is not moonshine fellas we did pay taxes on right. this um, and it is, uh, but it is a true corn whiskey. It's not just uh, neutral grain spirits watered down to 80 proof. This is a true corn whiskey. So we're going to think and we smell this corn and taste it. We're going to go back into time with Mr. Peabody and Sherman. But because it kind of looks like moonshine and people kind of call it moonshine, we're going to sing a song. Oh, it's the old Grandpa Jones number. Mm -hmm. Kick it off there, Hickory. I'll do it. Yeah. yeah. Put our man, there you go. We're going for surgery. There we go. I tend to speak.
from Niagara, Kentucky, down the way. So, Steve, you played with, uh, toured with uh, Grandpa Jones. Played didn't you? a couple of shows with Grandpa. Yeah, he was a he was a pretty funny fella. People know him from. He, uh, he was a colorful fella. Uh, that's so, uh, but he was something to work 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 with. Uh, so uh, again, welcome. We're going to go over the history here. We're going to taste this next whiskey, and uh, as you see, you see the color here. I'm pretty sure you can. But this is mellow corn. This is the same corn whiskey that we just tasted, which was unaged corn whiskey. And now this is going to represent. So we think about how the how the how, how bourbon became bourbon. Started with corn whiskey, and then it started going down the river. So there was only a couple major markets from the Louisville area, or as you all say, Louisville. We call it Louisville here, uh, named after King Louis XVI. They helped. They lent us the money for the Revolutionary War when we defeated the British. Um, then they named uh, the city after King Louis, so King Louis the Sixteenth. The next market down, if you went on the, on, on, put on those Kentucky longboats, uh, and uh, they've been put right here, Jeffrey, next to where your your um, relatives were on uh, Corn Island. Right. You had a what, what was the name of your relative on uh, Corn Island? William Faith. Yeah. William Faith. So William Jeffrey Faith. Faith. And William Faith was on Corn Island, a little island. It's about. Uh, Right, right across the, uh, the, 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 between here and Indiana, and the, and the crop grew so well of corn when they were fighting the British. Lieutenant Colonel George Rogers Clark, they named the little island, nicknamed it Corn Island. So yes, they have relatives from there, and so they would put the the uh, whiskey into barrels to transport it. They weren't trying to age it; just put it into barrels to try to get it from A to B. And because what they did to the barrel before they put that whiskey in there. Because it had been, uh, you see, his barrels came down from Pittsburgh and Pennsylvania there and uh, Philadelphia and places up north. Well, they didn't have refrigeration, so whatever they put in those barrels, they put a pickling agent in there like brine or, uh, you know, vinegar, things like that. But they didn't want to put their good whiskey into that barrel, so they burned the inside of it out. And there is the kind of the magic that starts happening. So they put that whiskey into that barrel that had been burned or charred, and that sugar from the wood... Uh, rush to that uh, inside area and as it gets hot as it does in Kentucky in summertime it gets up to 95 100 degrees as it is today right yeah. now and that would make that soak that bourbon and pull it into that wood going through that caramelized layer of sugar causing a little bit of color to happen it's not bourbon yet but it's still a uh, Bellows in and out. It takes about nine months, I believe, of what I read to get uh, Absolutely. from Louisville down to, uh, to, to New Orleans. To New Orleans. Yeah, the first stop would have been uh, would have been St. Louis. So another another city named after the French royal family, King Louis, and, that, that's, and their and their, the, their last name were Bourbon. So remember that, because that Bourbon is going to become the name of the whiskey that this starts to be. You're absolutely right, Hickory. Went through uh, New Orleans and then about uh, eight, nine months down from there. So we're going to taste this whiskey, which is bottle. this mellow corn. And it's just going to give you a little hint of that vanilla, honey, and caramel that we're kind of used to with bourbon today. But it's just a little bit of hint because it's in a used barrel just like it was 200 years ago. Do you want to show them a bottle? Steve, can you grab a bottle of mellow oh, There's one right here. Oh, there's, there's one right here. There you go. So this is mellow corn. As you can see, it's a that beautiful, Sweet. beautiful label. Mm -hmm. That label is the original label for 1945. But it's not that dark and deep color like bourbon just yet. I'll put a bourbon next to it so you can see. It's a little bit lighter because it's from a used barrel. But you get that corn flavor. Yep. Mm -hmm. mm. And that's a, you know, it's, it's all sweet. All the, you feel it's in the front of your mouth, front of your palate. And that's because it's in that used barrel and it had done, hadn't gotten, it's not a brand new barrel. It's just gonna give you a little hint of that vanilla, honey, and caramel. So what we do is we try, try to, to match some songs from the actual time period that we're talking about. And just so happens, there's a cool historical song that we love playing with when we sip on uh, mellow corn. And it's about making corn whiskey. And it's from the early 1800s. It's called Copper Kettle. Because the reason they were doing this even in the first place, guys, was because water was the liquid of last resort. It had bacteria in it, you know? <laughs> Benjamin and, uh, Franklin said something. What was it? Oh, uh, yeah. Ben, uh, uh, in wine, there is wisdom. In beer, there is freedom. And in water, there is bacteria. That's right. 
And so, uh, just like uh, Jeff, Jeffrey's uh, uh, he's got Fair's beers. Uh, he's got a, he's a local brewmaster and, and does Fair's beer. You were more likely to drink a beer with every meal back then, as we are, some of us do today. But, uh, do it. but or wine. But it wasn't like the beer or wine we drink today. What, what, what's the percentage of alcohol in your in your beer? Well, 5.2, and that was that was happening right at the turn of the century. But yeah, early beer was really low alcohol. Just yeah. About three percent, maybe. You know? Just to make it yeah. safe to drink, and then the wines. And so, how long does a does a beer, you know, in a in a in a uh, piece of pottery with a corn cob on top? And how long do you think that'll last? Not very long, right? Or wine. So what they did is they put it in a copper kettle, and then that made with the wine that would make brandy. And with with the beer, it would make whiskey. And there you go. Started getting a little, this is just a way to preserve your grains and a way to make it a higher proof to last to the next crop of corn that comes in, the next crop of rye and barley that come in. So here's a song called Copper Kettle. Look for a song that says, my daddy made corn whiskey, my granddaddy did too, and we ain't paid no whiskey tax since 1792. And that's the year that Kentucky became the 15th state. So kick off uh, Copper Kettle here. Get your copper kettle. Get your copper kettle. Oh, fill it with new made for match. And never will As you lay there by the juniper, while the moon shines bright, watching the jug filling. States were, were coming along. We were the 15th state, and then Tennessee comes along, and all of it starts filling in. Uh, we don't even have westward expansion much yet, but so we're just getting down through the rivers. It's before the steam, the steam engine, and, and all that. So the river becomes a very important part, and it gets that uh, color on that whiskey. It starts getting a reputation, right? It gets down to, to New Orleans. And it has a different color than that clear the whiskey that they were used to. Like red eye. That's right. When John Wayne like walks in the bar, bar, right? You need some of that good red eye. Bark beat. That's right. Because it had the deep amber color. It wasn't clear. It was the good stuff. The stuff from Kentucky they were making here. It was sweeter too than the whiskey that they were used to up north from 
New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, uh, because this had a little more corn in it, just like uh, where Jeffrey's relative was from Corn Island. Started getting reputation. So people down in, in the bars in New Orleans, they'd say, well, I just don't want that clear whiskey. I want that good uh, bourbon whiskey from Kentucky. Because on the sides of the barrel, it had where it left. It had stamped on there, bourbon, Kentucky. Old bourbon, Kentucky whiskey. And that just stated where it was from and the content. So they started putting that together. And so there we get the name of bourbon. So we're going to play a song, an old Doc Watson song that he revived, called Deep River Blues, and it's an old mind. Let it rain. specific recipe and it's going to be bourbon it's going to be my bourbon they they use what they had growing in their fields corn was the number one grain in kentucky still is uh, then you have a little bit of rye and a little bit of barley because those don't grow very well in human climate so we have less of it there's less of a of, 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 of amounts of it you need barley because that has the enzymes in it that turn the sugars uh into the the uh, the starches from those grains into fermentable sugars so what they did is uh, they used to use what they had. In the winter time, you're going to be making bourbon too. You're going to be making beer. You're going to be making bourbon. You're going to use corn that you had. You got a lot of corn. It's left over from the from the you know you have a couple growing growing uh, rotations of corn. But then you need a you needed a grain in the winter time, and that certainly would have been winter wheat. And that winter wheat is still the number two grow, uh, growing grain in Kentucky. And it goes into the, uh, the whiskeys that, uh, that we have here. And the third whiskey we're gonna taste is Larceny Bourbon. Larceny Bourbon has corn, it has barley, but instead of rye, it has wheat. 
So just a handful of bourbons today have wheat in them. Larceny is one of those. Old Fitzgerald's another one of those. Uh, some people have heard of a Weller and Maker's Mark. Those are some people know about. But Old Fitzgerald's one of those heralded old brands that Pappy Van Winkle had back in the day. And now Heaven Hill is uh, proud to have that in our in our lineup. And it's a beautiful whiskey. Have you ever seen that gorgeous 1956 diamond decanter? The Larceny bourbon is the small batch version of Old Fitzgerald. There it is right there. We call him Larceny, his name Johnny Fitzgerald because he was supposedly a, a treasury agent that uh, worked in the distilleries. And of course he would thief out a little bit of whiskey. They called him, I think I think a copper dog. Yeah, them things. So they take a little copper uh, a, a whiskey thief, thief it out of there. And of course he'd go back to, like a hummingbird. He'd keep going back to the ones he liked. Oh, bear got a little light, didn't Yeah, he got a little light. And when they were moving it out of the distillery, they said, oh, this one's lighter. That's Fitzgerald barrel. <laughs> he really likes that. So that's why it's called a, a, a larceny, because we steal old Fitzgerald barrels to make larceny. So cheers, everybody. Here's to uh, Johnny Fitzgerald and the Pappy and the old Fitzgerald larceny. Mm -hmm. So we move on to the next evolution of bourbon. We were in the uh, we're in the late 1800s now. We're uh, we're uh, the, the the country is is is, is expanding. It's growing. Uh, there's, there's a lot of people that needs to build uh, dams and bridges and, and locks and, and canals and, and there's a lot of dirty, dangerous, crappy jobs out there to have to be had. People worked hard, you know. And the cavalry, remember uh, Dances with Wolves and Kevin Costner? You know, he goes out there and you know he's he's, he's just he's the only guy on an outpost and, and that one guy went crazy, right? Pissed his pants and all that kind of stuff and shot himself in the head. I mean, all kinds of stuff. so things are tough. Things, things are tough. If you're gonna be in the cavalry in the 1800s, they gotta bribe you, right? So sometimes they use whiskey to do that. So they use it as a bonus in your pay. And so that's how a lot of things got built. But a lot of people just, uh, you know, we're working so hard, you know, like you get up at the crack of dawn, you know, the rooster crows, you get up, you work all day, you work hard, and you to Sometimes you need a little shot of something, you know, at night. Sometimes you need a little bracer in the morning to get it going. You know, this was, and it, it was high proof alcohol. You could pour it on your, you could pour it on your cuts. You could heal you from the outside in and the inside out. So I'm gonna play a, a song uh, from one of my, my, my heroes. And I've got his guitar, a model of his guitar here, Merle Travis. And Merle Travis is from Ebenezer, Kentucky, down in Muhlenberg County. And uh, he was born poor. His dad was a coal miner. And uh, so that's a real tribute to to all the folks who worked hard back in Kentucky, and all the places, all around the country, and just Ike Everly, right. Everly brothers from down in Muhlenberg County. Yeah, his daddy uh, Ike Everly was all probably the uh, Merle said he was probably one of the best thumb pickers out there. Merle Travis was known for uh, using a thumb pick and banjo picks like Cousin Steve uses on his banjo. There, uh, you don't have to use uh, any kind of picks, but it just kind of amplifies the, the, the strings there. And uh, so I'm gonna play a little. Uh, uh, 16 tons of, oh, about uh, his dad uh, working in the coal mines and uh, you had to load the, he's taking a nine pound hammer and uh, fill, fill, you had to do 16 tons a day. That's what you had to, had to I mean, I don't know what a ton, you know, 2,000 pounds, I mean, 16, so that's eight, oh my God, it's just a, so much. So just think about all the hard work everybody did. So here's a little, a little, a little tune. Some people say a man is made out of mud. Oh man's made out of muscle and blood, muscle and blood, skin and bones of mine that sweet, back that strong, you load 16 tons, what do you get, another day older and a deeper in the same Peter, don't you call me, I can't go, I owe my soul to the company store. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
Sometimes they, you know, they might put a little dynamite in your distillery if you, if you weren't you know, going to join their little group. You know? So they tended to, to get this. They were making cheaper whiskey. You know? It was just all about making money for those folks. Much different in Kentucky uh, than uh, Maryland, Pennsylvania, where they made straight whiskey, which came straight from the barrel. So all this beautiful color came straight from the color we got from the barrel, from that aging, remember, as it, as it stayed in that barrel. Well, the imitation whiskey makers from the Whiskey Trust, or compound whiskeys, they were just taking, um, uh, well, you remember your first high school party and the, uh, somebody had that bottle of Everclear, right? <laughs> and they thought they were going to be the first ones ever to take that Everclear and add a little, what, what was your recipe? Uh, we had like, uh, we put a uh, high, high C punch in it, right? There you put little fruit juices in it, you know, because it's 190 proof, I'm not going to drink that. So they, we just added so actually sometimes you cut up some fruit, put oh, some yeah. fruit in there, get a little color, a little flavor. Well, that's all they were doing. Uh, they weren't. They were using pr prune juice, cherry juice. Sometimes they would take like a not so safe stuff. They put uh, battery acid in there, or they take um, uh, tobacco spit, actual spittoons. They put it into the. Into the oof. So uh, yeah. yeah, so. We had a, the, the straight whiskey makers in Kentucky, they had an ally in Washington, D.C., and he was the Secretary of Treasury of the United States from Covington, Kentucky, right up across from Cincinnati. And his name was John Carlisle. And he was important because his agents held the keys of the distillery. Uh, kind of made mention to, to John E. Fitzgerald, who had keys to the distillery, right? And so he was in charge of all them. So it wasn't a huge leap. It didn't cost a lot more money because the agents were already on the distillery properties. So they got this law passed called the Bottled and Bond Act, and it happened on March 3rd, 1897. And the Bottled and Bond Act is a watershed moment for American spirits. Bottled and Bond Act was the first consumer protection legislation in the history of the United States. You know how when you go into, you like to, to, to the, you get gas and you're hungry or whatever, and you get a little, you get a hot pocket or something, right? And you pick up a bit, and it's got on the package, got how many calories are in there, or what's you know what's some of the what, what's actually made from. Well, that's the safe labeling of our food from the Pure uh, Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. Nine years before that act, we cared more about the quality of our whiskey, ladies and gentlemen, and that's why the Bottle and Bond Act is important. When it says bottled and bond on a whiskey or a spirit in the United States. That means that it has to come from one type of spirit. It has to come from one class of materials. So I can't mix like a brandy with a whiskey. I can't even mix a corn whiskey with a bourbon. That's how strict the law is. It has to stand on its own. It has to be aged for a minimum of four years in the correct type of wooden containers for the class of, of, of whiskey that it is. It has to, so you're guaranteed a good age on a bottle of bottle. Uh, whiskey can be 80 proof or higher. 
The bottle and bond has to be 100 proof every single time. So you're guaranteed a good age and you're guaranteed a good strength. And then you're guaranteed purity because it's pure water only that can get it down to that 100 proof. So think about that today, that's important. You know, to have a pure product, to have a guaranteed age, a guaranteed strength. Imagine in 1897, it was even more important. So uh, it has to also, you have to put the real name of the distillery on it. So it means you just can't buy it from anywhere. And if you do, you gotta tell them where you bought it from to be made. And one season too. So it's a finite number of barrels you can make in the distilling season. There's a spring season, January through June, and a fall season from July. So here are all these restrictions. So that's why I call, you know, it's got if it's got all the badges and all the medals, I call Bob and Bond the Green Beret of Spirits, right? Yeah. It's, it's the Navy SEAL. It's got all of them. So look for that, 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 uh, that, 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 on a bottle of whiskey, if it says bottled in bond on it, it is a Green Beret or Navy SEAL. And this is Evan Williams, bottled in bond. But uh, cheers, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, hope you're pairing these whiskeys with these songs because it really does help. Mm. Hey, you know we should take a moment out because I know we're probably getting close to uh, to the, the closing of this to sure. thank, um, thank our camera guy over here, Chris, <laughs> who's... Um, who's uh, Filming us and, and yeah. making sure that coming in the COVID, we're all we're all, uh, we're all trying to mask up and uh, and do what we can to, to be to be safe. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, Brooke here, who is uh, setting everything up and making sure. Yeah, Brooke's worked with Bourbon and Beyond from day one, and uh, really really awesome. And uh, we we can't wait till we're back at Bourbon and Beyond next year in yeah. person together. Yeah. We hope we yes. get to, to be able to do it with with, uh, with our buddy Fred Minnick. And uh, everybody with Danny Weber Productions, and everybody we just uh, we, we we you know we we miss it, but we're glad to be a part of this virtual party. Yes, so. absolutely. Thanks, Hickory. So until we can see you all in person, mm -hmm. we will continue, I guess, to do stuff like this. Absolutely.
Uh, Mr. Bill, how about that? So, yeah, I mentioned this small batch of single barrel bourbons that kicked off, you know. You know, they're just finding a way of what to do with this older whiskey, because, you know, bourbon and, and barrels, it, it, it's got well, an expiration date. left over from uh, the war effort, too. Absolutely. Right? I mean, you know, Korean War came around, and uh, they were starting to make a lot of high-proof alcohol that uh, had to do something with. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the, the distilleries did their part for both World and in World War II, and they made high-proof alcohol for the war effort, uh, so they weren't able to make whiskey uh, for, the, for the shelves and for people to buy, so that they, they went into this overproduction mode. And that's really what helped with the decline of bourbon in the 60s and 70s. And then in the 1960s, a couple other spirits came in the United States. Vodka and tequila really came on the forefront. There was a British uh, secret agent who liked his martinis shaken, not stirred. Of course, uh, and that Smirnoff vodka showed up in the movies. You know, a good Englishman would be drinking gin, right? But it's amazing what the product placement will do for a movie. Well, and it sure works for Smirnoff, and it worked out great. Uh, and then people started drinking uh, the vodkas and that, and so bourbon and whiskeys and rye whiskeys became kind of an afterthought, and the sales just kind of went down. As our owner, Max Shapira, says many times, it almost sent bourbon to the great liquor store in the sky. <laughs> the small batch of the single barrel bourbons like Elijah Craig, that brought back the industry. That helped really bring it back. It was Elmer T. Lee over at the Ancient Age Distillery in Frankfurt with uh, Blanton's came out with the first single barrel. Parker Beam and, uh, and our owner, uh, Max Shapira, teamed up. They had a 12-year-old, 12-year-old bourbon, a 94 proof, Elijah Craig. He's called one of the fathers of bourbon, if not the father of bourbon, because he uh, he was a Baptist preacher, and he was, uh, he was a, he, he did a lot of things. He made rope bridges. He, uh, he, uh, he, he was arrested for illegal preaching twice, and then he, from his jail cell, he would preach to people, just to rub it in a little bit. <laughs> Uh, he was, I'd like to have met the, the reverend, the good reverend, but he, uh, he had, a, he had a barn fire and he had some uh, barrels stored there. I don't know if he was smoking hickory. You uh, might have an idea. But the, uh, the, he burned his uh, barn down and affected some of his barrels. It didn't burn, burn it. He got it put out. And that's one of the stories of how the charred barrel, that yeah, that's right. The, the hippies helped put it out, uh, how, how the charred barrel came to be. And so that's why he's known as one of the fathers of bourbon. And then, of course, we had a uh, you know, Parker Bean was a big hand in that 12 year old bourbon. People weren't drinking 12 year old bourbon in 1986. You know, my father was around. Uh, my dad lived to be 94 years old, drank Heaven Hill six year old 90 proof. It's a green label. Uh, it is a cool bourbon. Still have it in Kentucky only. Did you ever tell them how, how much of that he had daily? Quart. My dad drank a quart of bourbon. Dad. That's what he told the doctor anyway. So, you know, that's so probably a lie. <laughs> I drank more than that. <laughs> But uh, that's what he fessed up to was a court. I, I love, I love that, uh, that that unit. Yeah, court, <laughs> court. You know, we don't measure them in quarts anymore. Yeah. It's a liter or a half, you know, a half. He even called it a quarter or a half gallon, you know, the handle. Yeah. Uh, so my dad, I, I told dad, I said, dad, why don't you drink this uh, Elijah Craig? He's 12 years old. He looked at me like I was crazy. He said, son, I don't trust a bourbon over six years old. Trust, trust a bourbon over six years old. I said, what does that mean? He goes, if it's over six years old, that's just the stuff they can't sell. Right? Now, he didn't he say stuff. stuff yeah, right. He didn't say stuff. He started with an S, but they didn't say stuff. <laughs> and that was the consumer's mindset. So this was really groundbreaking for our owner, Max Shapira, Parker Beam. Booker No came out with a really first barrel proof. Baker Beam. The higher Baker Beam with that higher, higher proof and higher floor. Big tasting whiskeys. Big, big, uh, flavorful. So Elijah Craig is very important for that. And now it leads us into our last whiskey we're going to taste, which is a, a, a rye whiskey. And this was out of Maryland. This was a Pikesville rye. Oh, my shirt, Jeff. Yeah. Pikesville, yeah. yeah. There it goes. Pikesville <laughs> rye whiskey. Now we got a, there's a city in Kentucky, our master distiller, Connor O'Driscoll, uh, who's our master distiller. He thought that was Pikeville, Kentucky. Right? And so he didn't notice the S on there when he first came over to our distillery. And this is uh, Connor's favorite whiskey. Uh, and, and for an Irishman, that's pretty big because the yeah, Irish yeah. whiskey is pretty light. Uh, but uh, he loves this whiskey. It's six years old. It's 110 proof. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not from Pikeville, Kentucky, but Pikesville. Cool story about uh, Pikesville Rye. Uh, it was actually in the city of uh, Maryland called Scott's Level. And they built the distillery, you're going to make rye whiskey. Well, they thought that Scott's, they didn't want to call it Scott's Level Rye because that sounds too much like Scotch whiskey. So the next town over was Pike, Pikesville. So they named it after Pikesville, just the next town over. And there's uh, Pikesville Rye. So this has uh, a, a 
the, the you know, Evan Williams and Elijah Craig had 10% rye in it. This has 51. This Whoa. is a true rye, straight rye whiskey. And this is six years old, 110 proof, named by Bill Murray's, uh, no, Bill Murray's, Jim Murray's, Bill Murray's too. Yeah. <laughs> Bill Murray's son coaches for University of Louisville basketball, so we do see uh, Bill here, but uh, this is Jim Murray's Whiskey Bible. He named this the number two whiskey of the world the first year it came up. Number two whiskey of the world. That's and uh, the best rye whiskey, whiskey of the world. What a so, uh, yeah. yeah. So here's to uh, the folks in Scotts Level, uh, Maryland, and uh, Pike, Pikesville. Pikesville, Kentucky, too. I don't know. And Pikesville, Kentucky. Kentucky. Yeah, That's I mean, right. A lot of good musicians from down that way. You know that. Oh, man. You feel that ride just pop. I mean, just an explosion of spice in your mouth. But that vanilla, honey, and caramel still there because that's six years old and that 110 fruit. It certainly doesn't drink like that, but it's, no, it's it, it has a punch. It is smooth. What a great way to, to spend an afternoon with Absolutely. the folks from Bourbon and Beyond. Absolutely. And, uh, Proudly and display our view. The the end end end. I guess we should tell them. We haven't told them where we were, I don't believe. That's absolutely. If you tell them where we are. Uh, we are in uh, downtown Louisville, Kentucky, on Main Street at the Evan Williams Experience, uh, Bourbon Experience. Uh, and uh, they have uh, just a wonderful complex here to visit and and uh, to learn about our native spirit um, and how they've been involved. And, and I'm not really sure what room we're in. This I'm is, usually in this the speakeasy. Is, yeah, this is, 18, this is the 1890s room. And this is typical of, of, a, of, of, a, of a setup. Uh, we have these barrels over here that have the spigots in front of them. And back then, like I said, when you had no a bottle of straight whiskey, there's no bottles. Yeah. You would bring your own bottles and they'd fill them. Okay? And uh, sometimes at the story, they call that the quart house. My dad would have loved the quart house. Yes. Right? <laughs> you would have uh, brought the whiskey and filled it up and uh, have that. You know, if you drink too much from the courthouse, you end up at the courthouse. Yeah, I think right. you do. But uh, that just shows that history here at the Evan Williams Bourbon Experience. And there's a lot of great history here. And it, it basically keys in on, you know, he was a leader of the town leader. He was in the town council. He was known to drink whiskey at the town council meetings, bring whiskey. They did vote. It is the minutes of the meeting that they had to wait till the end of the meeting to start drinking whiskey. This is for Evan Williams. Uh, uh, this is Evan Williams. Yeah, and he was also the wharf man. He was also the wharf master, so he would, uh, you know, with the, the falls of the Ohio River are here. That's why uh, the city's here, because you have to park your boat and then portage it down to Portland, uh, which is where you put it back in. So there's a lot of history right here on this block. Evan Williams actually made Whiskey, whiskey Row. We're on, we're on Whiskey Row. This is Whiskey Row in Louisville, Kentucky. And you'll want to come visit when you're in for Bourbon and Beyond. Take another day or two and come down and send. There's 11 attractions down here for the bourbon industry. Uh, the, the, the Bat Museum is right here. The Louisville Slugger Bat Museum, everything's right here. So it's a really cool place to come visit. Please take a couple extra days. It's such a, a great experience. So um, we're going to finish up with the song that I wrote. And, you know, there's a lot of people out there like a lot of different bourbons. Uh, we, we introduced you to six of the whiskeys from Heaven Hill Distillery, but we, we obviously, we, we know that there's other distilleries out there. We have well, friends it's, it's a really nice family. I mean, it's a tight-knit community. It's a community. tight-knit community. You know, just, uh, keep in mind, uh, which a great brand, which is uh, which owned by another distillery down here, Jack Daniels, the number one selling uh, American whiskey in the world. That sells more whiskey than the entire bourbon category combined. God bless them. We're all trying to yeah. do that, right? Yeah. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. So, uh, all the bourbon distillers you'll see here at Bourbon and Beyond, you won't just see Heaven Hill Distillery, you'll see Four Roses, you'll see Jim Bean, you'll see Maker's Mark, you'll see everybody here. And we love that. We are our family. Mm -hmm. So, I finished this this uh, this tasting. Appreciate y'all listening to us. And this is a song called Distillers Row. We're going down to Bartstown to see our other visitors experience the, the Bourbon Heritage Center in Bartstown, Kentucky. You go down North 3rd Street, across the railroad tracks, you'll see the uh, My Old Kentucky Home Dinner Train. Uh, and then you'll come to the next stop, like look over there, that's Fred Noe's house, which is Jim Beam's house. And Fred and Sandy live right there. Right, right next door. Right next door is uh, Freddie Jr. and Kay. Jr. They live right down there. And they got uh, just that little Booker. And, uh, and, and, and the Booker. What's his, the brand, what's his brand that he's got? Little Book? Well, he's or? got the Little Book. Little book. He's got Little Book. And so you go there. Across the street was Jack Bean. And he started early times distillery. Across the street from uh, from the Beans. Uh, on the other side was uh, Samuels. Samuels. Yeah. So Mr. Samuels just started uh, T.W. Samuels and then Maker's Mark. So in this song, I mentioned 26 bourbons in the song. And it tells a little story. I'll kind of keep you clued in. 
to, to, to where it is. Here we go.